Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Friday. Thank God, really. It, it is Friday. We have made it through this week, and who better to talk with on a Friday than our own Tim Miller. Tim, welcome back. How are you doing? Hey, Charlie. So good to be here. I'm on a little bit of an NBA Finals hangover, a great final. Steph Curry last night. I'm so happy for him. And uh, your, your pot, can I just say? Yeah, please. The podcast this week has been fantastic. I mean, it was really good. The guest host on Monday, I thought, was particularly strong. But I, I figured Katie, that's where you were going. Uh, <laughs> Katie, uh, Katie no. Turr, Katie Turr is so charming and was so interesting. People didn't listen. I had Jen Senior yesterday was so good. Anyway, people no, we, we, some we, of the we, podcasts we from earlier this week. They've they've all been really really good. And I appreciate you uh, sitting in for me on uh, on Monday. That was a fascinating discussion, um, and uh, and I appreciate people should go back and they should listen to it. Yeah, so, it was hey, out of the news cycle, all the gay, you know, just kind of gay history. So if you just need a little break, you're on a you're on a long walk this weekend, and if you missed it, go back and check it out. It was uh, you know a little a little news cycle break, but was, but not so, really. There were echoes. There are echoes of everything, you know. So congratulations on the Warriors. Well, it's not really a congratulations. I'm a Nuggets man, but I was I was I was happy for them, the local okay. team. Um, people are excited, and I just you know it it felt it, when somebody deserves something, it's nice to feel good about something. I mean, Steph is just like only six one. It looks like he weighs 112 pounds, and he, <laughs> he changed the whole game with, with his shot. And, and and the Warriors kind of left a bad taste in your mouth. The old Warriors before the pandemic because. They sort of cheated. They, you know, Ke- Kevin Durant signed with them in, the, in a free agency, and they created one of these super teams. And then, you know, Durant was kind of the the Darth Vader of the team. And then Durant leaves to create a new super team, and that totally flops. And Steph wins again. So it was like a little bit of a victory for the good and the righteous last night, despite me not not actually being a Warriors fan. <sighs> okay. <laughs> we should mention we're like a week away from the launch of your book, which congratulations once, once again. So we're all waiting for the big release. Yeah, thank you. Someone who hasn't written a book doesn't understand that this is kind of the, you're kind of in labor. It's, it's, it's <laughs> range period. The book is done. It's out there. There's nothing you can do about it. And you just have to wait. So it's, it's a, it's a very strange, very unique kind of moment. It is. I, well, I don't want to compare myself to, to to labor. That seems very hard. I'm happy I don't have to do that. Um, for the women listeners, but boy, it's tough. The anxiety, anxiety is rising. Waiting for feedback. You know, waiting to see if people actually want to buy it. But um, I have my my, my left hand. I've been, I'm a lefty. My left hand has been getting sore because I've been signing all the book plates per Tom Nichols's advice. So if people haven't got that, you can still. You know, you go on my Twitter I did feed. There's a link. That. There's a link. There's a link there, and I've been. It's huh. it's you know, people keep signing up, and so I have to keep doing more. And I'm trying to you know have them be a little clever or interesting. So if you signed up, not all of them are going to be clever or interesting. So good luck. It's kind of like a, getting a baseball card pack back when you were a kid, where you want the good one. You're going to get over that. You're going to get yeah. over that. I'm going to get over that and, and, and start writing all boring In the beginning, ones. it's like, I, I am going to personalize this and make. And <laughs> let me tell you, a week from now, it's just going to be Tim. It's going to be there. This I is going to be doing Tim exclamation point, which I think is yeah. kind of funny when I was, when I'm Actually, out of anything good. good, a little Jeb that's reference, good. but um, anyway, so people can sign up if you haven't, if you haven't pre-ordered, you can pre-order at this point. It's a week out. You can wait and go to your local indie bookstore too, but you know, don't forget. Okay. So this is the morning after the latest hearing. And, and, and I have to say that I, uh, you know, I want to talk about your piece about uh, Mike Pence, which yeah. w- with which I agree completely. I just want to, you know, for people who are, you know, hoping to tune in for some, you know, radical disagreement, uh, I completely uh, agree with it. These hearings have really been extraordinary, and I'm not, I'm not doing the the aesthetic, you know, hey, should you know, Judge Ludig have talked more quickly or something like that. It's just the way they are laying it out, and just the just the extraordinary narrative that even people, and this is what I'm kind of struggling with, even people like us who have written about this and talked about this and focused on this and frankly obsessed about this for a year and a half, it's still stunning to see it all laid out, which is a tribute, I think, to what the January 6th committee is doing. And so I, I, in my newsletter today, I kind of tried this, this, and I don't know whether people are going to you know, follow along with me on this, but to do this mental exercise, try to imagine that that you were learning all of this for the first time, that it was all fresh. You know, imagine instead of having the story come out in bits and pieces over the last year and a half, imagine it was all fresh. It was bursting into the news now. I mean, 
the president's criminal attempts to overturn the election, the batshit crazy conspiracy theories, the threats and the violence to intimidate Congress, you know, setting up his own vice president, pressuring him, then loosing a mob on him, how close the vice president might have come to something absolutely horrific, you know, the role of the Oath Keepers mobilizing to keep the president in power, this plot to use the electoral count to erase the results, the wife of a Supreme Court justice, you know, putting pressure on state legislators to resist the transfer. If we all had it like in a package, if we were just hearing secret tapes right now of what the president was saying and doing, it would be so extraordinary. It would be this political cataclysm. So do you know where I'm going on all of this? Because I, I do. And it's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not totally different from the conceit that I had for not yeah. my party on Snapchat this week. Because I was, I was like, that, yeah. yeah, because I, I was trying to do the same thing, but for you know younger folks, because it is hard to kind of wrap your head around when you're living through all of this. I, part of it is just because of the nature of the news cycle, which I think was what you were getting at this morning, is it's all yeah. coming so fast, and there's this Twitter news cycle. And we and get it, numb. Yeah. Yeah, you get numb to it, and it's just like it's a crazy thing after crazy thing. So the news cycle is one element to it. Also, just unless there is something that is physically impacting your life, right, like a war or like a shooting, unfortunately, uh, in your neighborhood. Yeah. For some of these things that are happening in Washington – it's kind of hard to, I think, for people to wrap their heads around like the context of it, and, and to really, you know, think about it in the broad scope of of history and of you know how significant it is. And, and and so, in some ways, what you're just laying out is just a more detailed way of what I was trying to say, which is like this is this is orders of magnitudes worse than Watergate. Uh, what what the president did, and and so for somebody, you know, who did not. <laughs> You know, for whom Watergate was history, or for even for whom they were a kid during Watergate, right? Like that seems, uh, that seemed like the worst possible thing imaginable. Right? The president had to resign. They tried to rob, you know, the other the other campaign. You know, there were secret tapes. They were lying about it. But like, if you really like, kind of pull the telescope back, I mean, Nixon wasn't even really involved in Watergate on the front end, right? Like, I mean, the controversy was about the cover-up on the back end and, you know, kind of the tape sexified it and then there was the sort of the deep throat in the Washington Post. Like, there, there were some elements of it that made it sexy, like, for the news. But just the facts of the case, like, in this, in this instance, it was the president of the United States that was orchestrating everything. Right? Everything orchestrating, flows yeah, from him. From him, everything. right, yeah. Orchestrating is a little bit maybe of a, not a precise word, considering that does Trump ever orchestrate anything? Uh, you know, I mean, he, or does he just emote and react? But it, but it emanated from him, right? Everything. Nothing, none of this would have happened if he, if he hadn't been the one pushing to stop the steal, right? It's not as, it's not like, John Eastman, you know, would have been writing coup memos, you know, had it been Mitt Romney that had lost, you know, the presidency. Um, and, and <laughs> right, you know, so like right. none of the other things that have, it's not like there would have been a mob on the on the Capitol grounds. Like none of the things that had happened would have happened were it not for Trump. That, that wasn't the case with Watergate. And then again, the Watergate was kind of this break in of spying on the other campaign, it was really more akin to like the 2016 Russia <laughs> gate than it was mm. to 2020, right? So we already kind of had our, our Watergate with the spy on Clinton's emails like that. That is that would be a, a more apt analogy. And, and this was literally a president attempting to overthrow the democracy to end our democracy. There were multiple strands. Amanda's written about this. Liz Cheney said called it seven different strands. Um, yeah. You can argue about like whether, you know, that was an organized seven strands or just like he pulled seven different levers. But I, that's kind of a distinction without a difference as far as I'm concerned. And so I, I, I do think that like when you, you know, sort of step back and put it in that context or as your newsletter wrote, you step back and like kind of look at it all together. I, cataclysm is the right word. I, it is It is without precedent since the Civil War. And I think that's what that was the point of the Ludig testimony yesterday. Um, and, you know, his written testimony, which we have up on the website, was was so compelling in that regard. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and this, I also made this point, which is, is sometimes these points need to be made, even though they are very obvious. And so I, I, I do think this is kind of the struggle. It's like things that we knew that were obvious, but 
wow, you need to emphasize this. And the worse than Watergate, unfortunately, became kind of a cliche. It, it came, became kind of this thing. Because everybody and says that. It, right, <laughs> exactly. Over and over Benghazi again. Benghazi was worse than Watergate. <laughs> but, you know, this is, as you point out, you know, by several orders of magnitude, much more serious. So, you know, when, when Judge Ludwig says the declaration that Donald Trump was, the, you know, should be the next president, would have plunged America into what I believe would have been tantamount to a revolution within a constitutional crisis in America that would have been the first constitutional crisis since the founding of the Republic. And, and I said, look, just everybody needs to take a moment to think about this, because this is not this isn't coming from Rachel Maddow or the MSNBC Green Room folks. Right. I mean, this is not the, you know, Pod Save America, the New York Times editorial page or, you know, the usual people who are out there with their you know, hair on fire. This is Michael freaking Ludic. Who, you know, you know, some of the listeners may not that you know may not have heard of him before, but he is a conservative's conservative. This is a former appeals court, federal appeals court judge, who was on George Bush's shortlist for the Supreme Court. This guy is a major heavyweight. So when you hear that kind of language coming from someone like Judge Ludic, it's like pay attention, people, to all of this. This is a huge thing. No, okay. Here's my my question for you, and I, and I know it's really tedious that the whole move the needle thing, and I'm I, I apologize, but I, I I do think you know if we learned all of this at once, if we're just now hearing the tapes, like in Watergate, if we were just woke up to the news, you know that the president had specifically targeted his vice president with these tweeted words of condemnation, if we just learned all of this stuff, and by the way, some of the stuff we are just learning you know, there wouldn't be any doubt about, you know, how serious the crisis was or the desperate need for accountability. But, okay, having said that, millions of Americans are in fact learning all of this for the first time. You and I have like wallowed in this and marinated in all of this, but there must be some people out there who are sitting in their living rooms watching this, seeing this on television as opposed to reading it in the New York Times for the first time going, fuck, that was really bad, right? I I hope so. I think. I so. hope so. I I, 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 yeah. I, I, I good think honest so. answer. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hope, hope so. so. I think so. Okay. Then I think the next question is like, what is their response to it, right? And, and I think this is where, you know, what we've seen over the last year has frustrated some of us, right, and has flummoxed some of us, which is that I, I, I think that people see, okay, well, that was bad, but is it oh, bad gosh. enough to break all the various? like rationalizations I have for why I've been defending these guys for five years or seven years or my whole life in, you know, certain cases, right? You know, look, there was an article today. I don't want to pick a fight with some random person, but, you know, like reasonable center-right folks, there was an article kind of that, that sort of went on about how, well, you know, we learned about all this, but it sure seems just kind of like some people who are crazy and lost control of, you know, their... their the system and like it, this wasn't like some great plot to overthrow democracy like it was really just you know a bunch of people like a handful of crazy people acting badly it's like God, could that really be a smart person's takeaway from this i, I guess no, I, no, I, I don't I think know it's important that we I, I think it's very important that we not name who we're talking about because i do not want to pick a fight with uh with noah rothman about <laughs> I, this. But, I, I guess but, I, but I, I, guess. I i had the same reaction because he he's a good guy he's one of our yeah. i mean he's he's been never trump in in the past but there is this desire to sort of normal, I'm sorry to use these words, to normalize it and to put it in a box like, okay, that that was bad, but it wasn't really that bad. That's a couple outliers. It was just the president of the United States. It just happened to be the president of the United States that was doing it and, you know, his legal team and multiple members of the House and the Senate and, you know, but, uh, but I don't, well, I, there, yeah. There, there, are, there are some aggressive turd polishers out there and then there's the minimizers. Actually, you know, now that you, you you bring this up, we ought to do a category of you know the, the full deplorables, the Molly Hemingways, the you know the the absolute turd polishers like Kim Strassel of the Wall Street Journal, and then sort of the the cool kid rationalizers. Yeah, like the rationalizers no, minimizing Noah. it, right? You know, compared to inflation, is this a big right? So that's what I worry about. I, I do think that there are people that are getting it, getting this new, but I, you know, they're they're people have a lot of competition for their concerns and their worries, right? And, right, right. and you know, you just look at the Wall Street Journal crowd and it's like, well, I don't wow. know. This was bad, but I get, I'm also, you know, but Joe Biden. So I, I think that there's going to continue to be an element of that. And I think that's why it's important to really, for those of us who understand how 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 big it is, to kind of talk about it in the to talk about what happened in these terms, and and I think that I think that's so what was so powerful about what what Ludig was saying. It's like this was not, 
you know, just like a couple of guys, you know, a couple of idiots who got things out of control. And it was, it was, we were on the brink of a, our first constitutional crisis since the founding. And to your point about Ludic, this was a guy, he was Ted Cruz's hero. Uh, Scalia, yeah. you know, very close yeah, to the yeah. Antonin Scalia. This is not like a rhino squish like Tim Miller and John Huntsman, you know. Okay. Yeah, no, not, <laughs> not, like not this, at all. This, this guy is a hardcore conservative. He did a very long interview with Bill Crystal over on Crystal Conversations a while excellent. back. People should listen to, yeah. So I, I think that when somebody like that says that, I'm hoping that, that it breaks through with people. Now, does it actually accrue a negative benefit to Republicans broadly? I don't know. Who knows? No, I, I don't I, know. And does it matter? Yeah, but, I, but I, I, can we worry about that? Should we judge this based on that? No. Trump himself maybe takes on water over this, and hopefully so. You know, it goes to the Brit Hume thing, which I had in the Not My Party, which was, yeah. I don't know if you saw this, Brit Hume was yes, on, I did. on Fox, he's going, well, well, the Democrats and never Trumpers really might be walking into something here, because if they completely damage Donald Trump, well, that could work to the Republicans' favor. You know, if, if Trump gets sidelined, I think a lot of Republicans kind of privately wish that would happen. It's like, Yep. Exactly, Britt. Exactly. Yeah. Like this is like that is the, the point of this hearing is not some three dimensional chess to make the Democrats midterms better. I, you know, there might be a couple of Democratic strategists who are saying that on background to reporters. But if you look at the behavior of Liz Cheney and look at the behavior of the people on the January 6th committee, this has not been a committee that is trying to maximize their short term political interest. Like this is about the broad scope of history. Yeah. It's about accountability. And sure, the, some of the I, right, like yeah. you can't completely remove politics from everything, but no, like, no. no, I mean, you know, Hume's point is actually is it that's not a bad point by him that that there are Republicans who this is doing a favor to Republicans who would like you know will, will somebody rid me of this troublesome priest and right. Mitch McConnell who would not pull the trigger when he had the chance got to be sitting there going this is good okay maybe you know this does this will take care of it but this is the problem with Republicans they're always looking for somebody else to clean up the mess. They're, they're always yeah. waiting for someone else to step up and do something and nobody has done it yet. So that's, that's, that's true. And, and, and we do need to keep in mind this split screen, which is that we have um, this whole uh, criminal conspiracy involving Donald Trump, um, the big lie completely exposed. You have Bill Barr talking about how it's all bullshit and the president had become uh, in effect uh, delusional. That's on one screen. The other screen, though, is what's happening in the primaries where anyone who acknowledges reality is being purged from the Republican Party. This is the same week that Congressman Tom Rice was you know, thoroughly destroyed in his primary. You have uh, other election deniers winning in Nevada. So, uh, you know, the Republican Party is still tightly in the embrace, not just of Donald Trump, but of the big lie. And it's become, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it's become, somebody asked me last night on one of the shows, well, does this make a difference? And I said, for Republicans, I said, in the short term, no, because it's too deeply ingrained. When you have guys like your good buddy, you know, Dave McCormick, in Pennsylvania, who knows better, feeling the need to, you know, parrot the same lies. This gives you an indication. Everybody's got to pretend that they believe the big lie, whether they don't, which means that team normal really is functionally exactly the same as team MAGA, right? Am I taking yeah. your line? Am I stealing you your stealing. line? Yeah, yeah. I, I like call okay. this team coup, but that's okay. You yeah, can yeah, steal yeah, it. Yeah. I stole okay. Sarah Longwell's line on TV. I forget which one it was, and people kept complimenting me for it, and I felt I was like, oh my god, I, I, it just kind of which, came out which of my line mouth. Which line was it? Which was? Uh, which one? I have to. I have to I give it, give it I, back. I think it was about uh, something in the sheets, uh, Youngkin in the sheets, Trump in the oh, right, streets, right. or whatever it was. Um, right, so you know that happens. We're all it's it's communal here. You know, from each from every take, from each according to their ability, to each according to their take needs at the bulwark but uh look I, charlie I, I there are two elements i want to respond to, to that one is the primary results on the split screen so the best case scenario five of the 10 house republicans who voted to impeach donald trump are gone tom rice was just defeated as you mentioned uh, handily soundly in south carolina again tom rice by the way is another ludig tea party republican not a squish yeah. um yeah. and and you know got crushed but loses with dignity yeah. yeah, yeah, loses the dignity. Yeah. God bless him. God bless. Yeah. Right. Thank goodness Absolutely. for Tom Rice. But yeah. just there. Exactly. So four have retired. Tom Rice gets crushed. Valadeo survives in California. So so there's one who is going to be around next time. Five are gone. Four left. I think we all know that Liz Cheney is going to lose. Um, she's doing a kamikaze mission right now. So even if the other three of the four 
the best case scenario is that when when the next Congress gavels in, the Republican caucus will only have four members devoted to impeach Donald Trump. So so when people say that the party has actually become you know more in Trump's grip since January sixth, that the party will that the party will be more sympathetic to the big lie, more anti democratic in twenty twenty three than it was on January 5th and January 6th, that is not hyperbole. That is a literal description of the House caucus. Now, there are other things happening in politics, right? Yeah. Maybe, you know, uh, can't, future primaries will be different and, uh, you know, the tides are coming in and out. But but the the caucus of Republic, the elected Republicans in Congress will be more MAGA, more Trumpy, more anti-democratic next time. Just one other thing about the, the committee. I thought Crystal made a good point on Thursday night, Bulwark last night on this. Just to sort of show how dramatic this committee has been, even for people that pay close attention, if I was on this pod, and you probably asked me this two weeks ago, and said, do you think anything's going to come out of this, like actual repercussions? I, I would have said no. I, you know, I would have said, I don't think DOJ ends up acting. I have no faith oh, in the criminal justice wow. system. Today, I'm not going to say yes. But, but boy, I mean, the committee sure seems like they're making a pretty compelling case to Merrick Garland to act. And DOJ had to put out a press release yesterday, you know, talking about how they need, they, they would like to see some of the depositions. Uh, there's some, you know, kind of legal wrangling over whether that's actually allowed, um, you know, because DOJ needs subpoenas where Congress does not. But just to speak to the drama and how compelling and how convincing they've been and how meticulous the committee's been, I, I don't think that the door is closed to that after this. Do oh, you? no. I think, you know, in answer to the question, will the Justice Department take action? I would say, you know, fuck yes, because what is the alternative? And and I, I thought that uh, Kyle Cheney and Nicholas Wu over at Politico really nailed this. They had a really interesting insight. You know, there's there's this sort of there's a debate about whether or not the the committee will make a quote unquote criminal referral to the Justice Department, which I think is actually overblown in retrospect, because yeah. that's really not what they do. But but this is their insight that this is the criminal referral. Let me read you what they wrote. For all of the panel's public quibbling over whether to vote on referring Trump to the Justice Department for a possible criminal case, members did it their own way. They used Thursday's public hearing to present what they see as some of their most compelling evidence and thereby mount a case with Attorney General Merrick Garland watching that Trump broke the law in his effort to make former Vice President uh, Mike Pence single-handedly overturn the election. So everything they're doing is a criminal referral. That's a great point. Someone asked me last night, said, well, what happens if they don't? What happens if, unlike Watergate, there are no consequences and Donald Trump is not held accountable? And my answer was, well, to quote uh, Judge Ludic, that would drive a stake through the heart of American democracy. I mean, that if, if you have Trump skate on this and come back to power, Trump 2.0, and people really need to get their heads around this, Trump 2.0 will be exponentially worse than Trump 1.0. I mean, because, you know, the story of, you know, the team normal and all the people around him who did the right thing. And again, we can debate that endlessly, whether they should have done more, done whatever. Those kinds of people will not be around him yeah. in Trump 2.0. He will have learned the lesson that he needs the absolute loyalists, the people, the yes men, people like Jeffrey Clark, who will be willing to do his bidding at the Department of Justice, people like uh, you know, the nut job. So for, for all of the disdain that we can give for the people who were there and didn't say anything at the time, they were there and they won't be around for the next term. So people need to understand. Yeah. And in worst case scenario terms, going back to your podcast yesterday about Bannon uh, with Jen yeah. Senior, like Bannon knows this. Right. Mm -hmm. Like this is what, right. You know, that, that, those types, Bannon knows this, uh, yes. you know, the those types, they know. And that, that is why, you know, if, if there becomes, and you know, now we're getting into rotisserie uh, politics, but you know, people like, like little fantasy politics from time to time, but that if we do get the mano a mano of DeSantis and Trump, um, that is why the Bannons of the world will put their thumb on the scale for Trump, you know, big in a big way, because they know, that that Trump that this was Trump's big from their perspective big mistake last time is he cared yep. too much about what the establishment types thought and he put too many you know deep staters in key positions and and he sees now you know that he he needed a, a toady at the Department of Defense not Mark Esper for whatever you think about Mark Esper right? right he needed a toady at the Vice President's office not Mike Pence whatever you think about my, all Mike Pence's failures and so 
there's no doubt that that is their big lesson for this. And, and, and I think that speaks to your point about the accountability. I, how, how John Eastman skates on this without having to enter a courtroom, I, I think that would be a very disappointing well, outcome. Well, see, that's it. I mean, John Eastman knows that he has criminal liability. I mean, he knows it. He no, asked for a pardon. <laughs> He's a lawyer. (laughs) Only people who are guilty ask for pardons. And then he he invokes the Fifth Amendment a hundred times. He and and again we had that tape of the White House lawyer telling him, You need to get a great criminal lawyer. So they all knew that there was a criminal liability here. So I I think this case is so overwhelming. By by the way, I want to give credit. I think it was to Chris Hayes who made an interesting point last night. You know, you you know, everyone who's been testifying. And by the way, I think it's worth pointing out that everyone who has testified so far, am I right about this, is a Republican or a member of the Trump administration. There are no Democrats. There are no there are no DNC type. This is all coming from within the House. And every one of them knew that John Eastman was fucking nuts. They all knew he was crazy. So it raises the question, then why did he have all those meetings? What, you know, what, why was John Eastman, you know, going to the White House and sitting with this person and talking to this person and everything with everyone going, you are out of your mind. And the answer to this question, I'm again, I want to give credit to Hayes. It's because John Eastman was working for Donald Trump. The only reason anyone pays attention to John fucking Eastman is because the president of the United States basically said, this is the guy I'm working with him, Right. The only reason this stuff is happening, so it all flows from him. And uh, yeah, and the second reason is that the quote unquote team normal was all letting them happen. You know, Jared yeah. Kushner had had de- had already decamped to his new house in Miami, and you know was already buttering up MBS. And anybody who was was calling him about how crazy it was was a whiner for his te- for his testimony. So that's why that's the second that's the second reason why. Okay, so. Tim, we we need to dive into this whole question of Mike Pence and whether Mike Pence was a hero or not, because you have a great piece. Um, We have had an ongoing debate and discussion about this. And let's talk about that after this. Hey, country music fans, get ready to make nice because America's best-selling female group, The Chicks, are hitting some wide open spaces on the road this summer and will bring their North American tour to a city near you. Plus, they'll be joined by special guests Patty Griffin and Jenny Lewis on select dates. Cowboy, take me away to see this dynamic trio live on stage. Get your tickets today at LiveNation.com. Do you hate hearing ads? If so, I've got a solution for you. Join Bulwark Plus, where members enjoy ad-free editions of this show and all the podcasts in our Bulwark network, like Beg to Differ with Mona Charon and The Focus Group with Sarah Longwell. There's also the member-only podcast, The Secret Show, and The Next Level with Tim Miller. You can give a Bulwark Plus membership a try for the next 30 days for free. Simply go to thebulwark.com slash charlie to claim your free trial today. This offer is exclusively for listeners of this podcast, The Bulwark Podcast. That is thebulwark.com slash charlie. Okay, we are back with Tim Miller after a consequential. I have to say that, um, look, I I struggle against, you know, throwing around the word hero. But let me tell you an analogy that I used um, that I think is is flawed. And and I'm willing to have you pick it apart. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I use it on the secret podcast with, with, with Mona. So let's imagine that we're talking about a soldier in wartime uh, who has been a coward and a malingerer and pretty much a complete asshole you know, his entire career, you know, that, that, uh, that, that he, that he's never stepped up, uh, to do, to do his duty. I mean, not, 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 not a great soldier, but you know, when it really matters, um, during the firefight, he throws himself on a hand grenade to save his, his, uh, his comrades. Is that person a a hero or not? I I think we all would acknowledge that makes him a hero that moment. So here's Mike Pence, Toady, sycophant, yes man. And yet at the moment it really mattered, he threw himself on the hand grenade to protect American democracy. Tim Miller. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're going to strain this analogy uh, to its <laughs> to, to the furthest possible ends, but I guess I would say what Mike Pence did would he, is he like, 
kicked the hand grenade away from his colleague and like kicked it down the hill a little bit and then the hand grenade went off and like blew up a different part of the um you know a different part of the the army right uh you know it blew up the barracks i just did he jump on it this is i guess the point of my article jumping on it requires finishing the job like like being the person that puts themselves between the arsonist or in this case the person throwing the hand grenade donald trump and the rest of the democracy the rest of the army he he didn't really do that I, I, he did his job that day and so as i said in the article I, he gets a gold star for that I and mean, he did the bare minimum that it was required to him yeah. by him to the constitution so congratulations i'm happy for him i, I think he obviously showed some personal courage that day uh, uh not leaving the capital coming back you know a weaker man might not have done that so i I give him a kudos for that but okay i went and saw we did a podcast after it i flew to south carolina to see his first speech after all that Mm -hmm. and and it was mostly about how donald trump had broad shouldered leadership and was great and how great the trump pence administration was and how oh he might have he might have got out a little over his skis after the election ah that's not it for me. I, I yeah. guess just not it. He's not. And, and so yesterday, we can talk about the politics of this, but like yesterday's hearing needed Mike Pence. This, 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 yeah. this committee needs Mike Pence is the central witness. He is the one who knows that Donald Trump, I, we've heard secondhand, Donald Trump didn't call the Secret Service. Donald Trump didn't try to help save Mike Pence. Donald Trump didn't call the military. Okay, but. But and Mike Pence had to. So was Mike Pence acting as the commander in chief that day? Was he the one ordering the military yes. around? That it sounds it like seems it. like yes. But shouldn't Mike Pence have to testify that under the record for under oath for history? And 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 I you know why is point. his like lawyer there acting as his spokesperson saying, well, Paul Ryan called Mike Pence. We need Mike Pence to tell us who called Mike Pence that day. He wants it both ways. He he yeah. wants to throw himself on the hand grenade and still survive. But okay, let me tell you what what where I think um, that m- my analogy about uh, the soldier throwing himself on the hand grenade uh, doesn't really work here. Okay. Um, now, I don't think that when Mike Pence did this, and by the way, I give him a lot more credit than a lot of people do because I mean this this you know look, I understand you do the bare minimum, but but understanding the the, the moment and the reality and the consequences, it was a, still a remarkable decision for him to but to push back against. I mean, I'm, and I'm glad he did. And we're going to rely on people like this, you know, uh, in in the future to uh, you know to, to to stand up against uh, the pressure. Sure. But uh, but here's the thing. I don't think he thought he was throwing himself on a hand grenade because I think that like everyone else in rational um, in the rational universe, he probably thought that this was going to be the end of Donald Trump. Yep. He could not possibly have imagined that a year later that Donald Trump would be in firm control of the Republican Party and that Republican voters would uh, still accept the big lie and frankly not care about what was happening on January. He could not have imagined that this was not a turning point that he would be destroying himself politically because the party would look at his courage and his principle and Donald Trump's mendacity and criminal conspiracy and say, yeah, we're okay with Trump. And no, the fact that you and and others are telling the truth and doing the right thing, we're not interested in that. We want to move on from that. He couldn't have imagined that any more than anyone else because I go back to that day and the day after and imagine what I mean, remember what we all thought was going to happen, including people like, and I'm not just talking about bulwark types. I'm talking about what Mitch McConnell thought, what Kevin McCarthy thought, what virtually everyone this side of yeah, Matt Go back Gates to this will thought. not pass. Yeah, go back to this yeah. will not pass. Lindsey Graham is in there saying, maybe this exactly. is going to be good for the country. Joe Biden will come in. Who can get mad at no, Joe Biden? Just... And like, we'll get rid of Trump. Right. Right? This was, yeah. So Stu Stevens has a uh, a tweet. No one read. You know, makes makes an interesting point. And again, I'm I'm more pro Pence than than you know some of the other folks here. But but he he writes, I appreciate that Pence could have hurt America more than he did. But let's get real. He was surrounded by a plot to end democracy, and he called Dan Quayle not the FBI. <laughs> he didn't call. <laughs> He didn't hold a press conference to warn. He waited to see who was going to win and threw in with them at the last moment. Ah, I don't know. Um, You know, again, I I get that. But I mean, 
It's, I, I mean, it's better than not, sure. That's yeah. what I'm saying. He, a kudos, he deserves a kudos. Uh, but to Stu's point, Mark Short did call the Secret Service the day before the sex mm-hmm. and say they were worried about Pence's own safety. Uh, so, okay. You know, yeah. I, I just, and he could have been leaky, he could have been testifying. I, I just want to make one pitch because I know there are a handful of Republican strategist types who hate listen to this, or maybe they love listen to it because, you know, we're their id that they can't actually say during consultant meetings. And, and I just, I want to make this pitch in a serious way. Because I think that, and I, I reference this in the article, but you know, you have more time to tease it out on a podcast. The the I know what Mike Pence's strategists are saying to them. I don't know personally; they haven't told me. But I, I I've been in those rooms. I get it. It's like, okay, you know, why don't we like let this play out? You know, you did your duty that day. You did your duty by Mark, by sending Mark Short to testify to this committee. Your former chief of staff. You sent your counsel. Uh, you know, you don't need to give in to the resistance woke mob, right? And and go and go whole hog. You've kind of done what you need to do. Now you need to plot to be the next act, right? Like you're, it's it's you, it's going to be your turn. You are the vice president, and and the smart political move is to do this dance where you talk about how all the great stuff that the Trump Pence administration did and how key you were to all of it, and and you know, kind of hope that that the Democrats and Liz Cheney do your dirty work for you or that the actuarial timetables do their, do their work for you and that this committee makes Trump look bad and that, that you start to kind of emerge as, as maybe a natural successor and that you go to Iowa where you know you have this Christian conservative base in Iowa where the first caucus is and, and you, you've got the base of support there that nobody else does, even that Ron DeSantis, and you get a surprise win in Iowa and all of a sudden, Mike, Mike it's Mike Pence. All of a sudden, the plane says Pence on the side not trump pence and so you know and so you've got to like play this out and and if you go actually jump on the hand grenade and try to <clears throat> you know kill trump in the chest you become like a bulwark type you have no future no career and and so i know that's what they're that's saying a bulwark that, type. that's your definition of a bulwark type. yeah right only well, in the pro in the republican party we have okay. we, we all have future you know as uh, you know being feted by our yeah. new liberal Happy friends friday <laughs> <laughs> yeah you become them you become ostracized right uh sorry charlie i didn't realize that hit a little cut cut <laughs> cut a little too close to the bone no. there. um no. but uh I, okay that's a pitch what i'm saying is that they're probably wrong like they're not a hundred percent wrong. I don't know. Is there a five percent chance that that could work out? Sure, but I've got a one hundred percent pitch for Mike Pence, which is that Mike Pence isn't going to be the next Republican nominee, almost certainly. And this party, you know, is very ready to move on to Ron DeSantis if the actual aerial tables come for Trump. Mike Pence goes into a primary with a negatives among the hard MAGA base that makes things very challenging for him to win a primary. It's very hard to imagine that, that, that people that, you know, the Republican base turns their local lonely eyes to Mike Pence. And and that, and that instead of this kind of long shot, kind of sometimes Trump bid, you actually put a stake through the heart of the man who left you for dead. The man who 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 when we saw that just haunting picture of Mike Pence looking at the phone, watching Donald Trump do the video where he cheers on the mob that had been there to kill Mike Pence, that had been 40 feet from him, wanting him to die. Mike Pence could could actually, you know, demonstrate the courage to say, no, like I, I, I will actually be the one that puts the dirt on this person's grave and that for decades and generations, people will say, man, that is a person that demonstrated real courage who came forth and blew up his, you know, a political career that was, let's be honest, probably over anyway, and gave the dramatic testimony in prime time that was needed to kind of tie this bow together together to show that that even inside the house that Donald Trump cares about himself so much that he was ready to end our democracy and end Mike Pence's life like Mike Pence has the goods like he is the person who could do it and and I don't know I mean that that seems like a nice legacy certainly a better legacy than going to a half empty pizza ranch in Iowa and watching Ron DeSantis beat you that's my pitch to the Republican no, consultants who are listening. That, that, that's good. Can I just, uh, Mike Pence, call your office. We have a voice <laughs> memo for you. Uh, one, 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 one last point. Trump issued a statement on, I was going to say tweeted, but he, of course, doesn't do that anymore, on Truth Social. Do you see this thing all in caps? I want equal time. 
He wants yeah. equal time. And people are saying, well, you know, he should come in front of the committee or he should do this. No, I, I have a different take on that. I think that was a tell because the one thing that Donald Trump understands is the power of television. This is his world. This is his turf, right? Television is television creation. And when he tweeted out all in caps that he wants equal time, in some ways it was a backhanded acknowledgement that this is a television show that is 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 having some impact. That's and that he good wants, ratings. He, he, you know, you know what I'm, sa I'm saying here that that he seems to be in some way indirectly acknowledging that this might be a problem because you have primetime television. It's telling a story and he wants his own show and he doesn't get his show. So I just I, I, th I throw that I throw that out here. So, you know, there's so much yeah. else going on here. And I, 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 I apologize. I mean, like next week, because we have such a short attention span, a couple of weeks ago, it was all Ukraine. Now it's all January 6th. Next week, I'm afraid um, it's going to be all Roe versus Wade. And we know we're going to talk about that. Um, obviously, there's also this massive economic meltdown going on. I'm not going to pretend that's not happening, uh, you know, with the stock market crashing and the inflation and this sort of sense that things are spinning out of control. And then we have this, uh, and I actually deleted this from my newsletter just so people know, because it, it, <laughs> it felt, it, 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 no, it just didn't feel like it fit the moment. But I'm going to throw it out to you because I know you talked about it on the live stream last night. Mark Leibovich, who is a great reporter, very interesting guy, who used to be with the New York Times, now is with Atlantic, has a, you know, very, you know I, I think an important piece. Um, is that is that sort of just a generic way of, of, of saying, you know, it's an interesting piece, a lot of generating a lot of buzz that Joe Biden is too old and that Joe Biden is not too old to be president now. He's, he's, it's bullshit that he's not, you know, fit for office, but he's too old to run for a second term. And it's like, okay, Joe, you've done your job, but you need to pass the baton now. What do you think, Tim? You guys talked about it last night. Yeah. What do you, um, where do you come down? You know, look, I, I think that the, that A, it's interesting that Leibovich said this and it sort of Leibovich, broke yeah. a little bit of Omerta, you know, like mm -hmm. Leibovich is very much in, and he wrote this town. So he's very much yep. in the, in the buzz of this town. And I think that if democratic types were not saying this to him, it was not something that he would write. And so I, I guess, I think that's my most interesting takeaway, which is I think sometimes we get to have a little bit of clarity because, as I said earlier, our careers are over here at the Bulwark, Charlie Sykes. So, like, you know, we can we have an ability to kind of be honest in a way that sometimes people in politics don't. Um, and I just I just don't know that it does the Democrats any good to kind of pretend that like what Leibovich is writing isn't true. And, and I guess that's where I come down on this is that I, that sometimes there is this feeling that oh you know, to be loyal to my side or, oh, because, you know, Donald, these, these other foes are so authoritarian. Like the, like I have to kind of not really say what I think about, you know, Dem the Democrats like flaws or weaknesses or, or potential threats. And I, and I just think that that's the opposite of true. Right. Uh, and, and that, and that if it is true that Joe Biden is, is perceived to be too old, to run again next time, then there should be some discussion and thinking about like what should be done about it, especially given the threat on the other side. And, and I, well, just, I just don't yeah. think there's any doubt that his numbers, look, if you looked at it, if you look at this number, I met with um, one of the Senate candidates um, a couple weeks ago and, and, and they pointed out to me that, that the governor uh, was a democratic Senate candidate, that the governor of Wisconsin, uh, Tony Evers, has his approval rating is like 10 points higher than Biden's, maybe more. Now, some of the reason for that is that people don't blame their governor for the national economic situation. That's some of the 10%. But, but if you listen to Sarah's focus groups, if you just talk to humans in life, it's hard to believe that some of that percent isn't just this kind of sense that people have when they see Joe Biden, that he isn't up for it. Maybe that's unfair, but politics isn't fair. OK, so I, I think that he had the Joe Biden was the right person for this moment. Um, maybe it turns out that he's the right person again and that he's the only option in 2024. Uh, I, you know, we'll see, I guess. I, I don't like the, talking about that now doesn't make much sense. But I think talking about the just acknowledging the political reality that he's perceived as, as that his age is perceived as a bad thing, that it's hurting him, that it's hurting his political standing, that's hurting the Democrats political standing. And maybe there should be some thinking about what what option Plan B, B is. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. And so I'm glad that Mark Mark wrote that um, uh, yeah. so, to sort of break this kind of 
I, you know, it's, I don't, it's not like there was this democratic deep state that was banning people from saying Joe Biden's too old, but I, you know, there's just this sort of sense that like, eh, I don't, should no, I really it, go there? Should I really go right. there? Well, and you, you had that uh, piece in the New York Times that talked about it. And well, he and he, he yeah. cites uh, Sarah Longwell in this article. Um, he, he says, you know, for all the trauma that Trump inflicted on the country during his terms, he appears to have kept the devotion of his base voters. Trump has even edged Biden by a few points in a recent batch of two uh, of, of way too early rematch polls. Swing voters, independents, and Republicans who voted for Biden in 2020 are among the most unenthusiastic to the idea of his running again, says Sarah Longwell who hosts the podcast, The Focus Group for the Bulwark. They mainly cite his age, she adds. And Republican voters give every indication of being far more motivated right now than Democrats, many of whom are sounding alarmingly demoralized. It hurts to even imagine what another Biden-Trump race would look like. Okay, so I, I accept all of this. My problem is, is the is is the plan B. And maybe the fact that this conversation is happening early is is a recognition of that. But um, I just certainly can imagine what a complete shit show the uh, 2024 Democratic primaries would be. And Tim, I still remember quite vividly, as I'm sure you do, the article you wrote back in 2020, <laughs> when you basically said the Democrats have 10 days in order to avert absolute disaster. It looked like Bernie Sanders was going to be the nominee. You wrote a piece saying, hey, it is time for you to understand you know, the stakes. And I, I thought you were perhaps a little bit too late there, but you sounded the alarm at exactly the right moment. Democrats did a course correction. But I think it's fair to say that uh, the Democratic Party was 10 days away from setting itself on fire back in 2020. And there's no reason to believe they wouldn't do that in a post-Biden 2024 primary contest. Yeah, there was, a, there was the one line in the Leibovich piece that stood out to me is he's like, you could imagine an Iowa soapbox with some younger people like Chris Murphy and, and Pete Buttigieg and AOC, uh, and, you know, bringing new vigor and liveliness <sighs> to the party. And I was like, and I, you know, I read that, but I was like, you know, I got whatever. I've, I've, <laughs> I, I, all yeah, those people I, I have various <laughs> degrees of admi admiration for. I, 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 I think I might be talking to Chris Murphy next week, actually, for Not My Party, a little preview. Um, hopefully we lock that in. And well, he's, uh, been, he's been a grown up. Yeah. yeah, he's been amazing. He's been an amazing grown up. But OK. But I don't know. I saw that. And that paragraph that gave Leibovich this sense of, you know, potential excitement gave me like a dread uh, chill up my spine. I was like, boy, an open primary for the Democrats. I could end up being a crazy town fest, you know, where where they each try to out Bernie and out woke each other. And and is there anybody that has the, you know, kind of brand and independence and charisma to buck that? You know, Biden bucked it like in large part, I think, you know, because he had the Obama stamp of approval, right, that he had been around and he had this brand, he had this like loyalty with particularly the older black voters in the Democratic Party. Uh, if there is nobody else that has that, do you end up with, the, you know, kind of one of those crazy, you know, debates where it's like, should we decriminalize illegal immigration? And, <laughs> you know, 19 people raise their hand. Yes. Oh, right? Do you remember I, you know, that? Oh. You don't, yeah, you don't want that. Right. So anyway, well, that's uh, what you're going to uh, We all uh, have a lot of time to talk about that. But that, that all the plan well, B is certainly no no guarantee to be better than the plan A. That's a fair point. OK, but obviously the question we you have to ask, though, is I have a hard time imagining the Democratic Party not giving the nomination to Kamala Harris. And the question is, what does a Trump Kamala Harris 2024 matchup look like to you? Okay, I just got, I long, just started shivering. Hey, I just started shivering. Hey, Katie, can we cut long, this? <laughs> no, 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 no. Long, long, long pause. I just uh, like the transcript. Long, long silence. <laughs> Concerning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Concerning. I fair enough. Fair enough. You know Concerning. what? It's where we have a lot of ground to cover. Okay. <laughs> one in, in the in the few moments we have left. Yeah. Talk to me about Saudi Arabia and and, and Biden's Jamal. decision to go there. Jamal yes, Khashoggi. one of my pet issues. So there are two things happening Khashoggi. at the same time yeah, in Jamal sports Khashoggi. and 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 Jamal geopolitics. Khashoggi. So this weekend is is the U.S. Open uh, in Boston uh, for golf watchers, and among the players there are Phil Mickelson and Johnson who both agreed to play on the Saudi Arabian Live Tour. And I, I bring this up, this is very relevant to politics, because, because MBS is trying to uh, uh, you know, gain credibility on the world stage after he murdered a journalist that wrote for an American outlet, Jamal Khashoggi, and, and sent a kill squad to murder other people. It failed, kidnapping people. 
in Saudi Arabia, and there are you know children and other you know people that have been kidnapped by by MBS. Uh, this is a bad bad actor, uh, but you know with the oil prices going up. Uh, you know, they're just throwing around money in Saudi right now. Like it's, you know, poker chips at the casino. I mean, they got, they, they're just making it rain. And so they've been using this money to buy off cultural institutions, movie production, but also by starting this golf tour. And they, and they've recruited these huge name golfers, Greg Norman, Phil Mickelson to come play for the Saudi bone saw golf turn, a golf tour called the live golf tour. Now, uh, the the PGA has sort of just like let this happen, and so, so now some of the live golfers are playing this weekend at the U.S. Open, which is pretty dramatic. And after day one, Phil was a plus eight, and and the person who's spoken with the most moral clarity, my golf doppelganger Rory McIlroy, was in second place at minus three. So you know maybe some good karma there. Uh, but uh, what what how you tie this into politics is that in the fall in the fall. When when the PGA Tour is over, the Live Tour is going to hold their tournaments at Trump Properties, at Doral, here. So this MBS Kushner connection, the MBS Trump connection, this will the, the Saudi will be all part of our culture culture war divides. And instead of speaking with moral clarity about this, Joe Biden, instead of you know working to uh, uh, you know do as much drilling as we can on American soil, instead of trying to find another partner throughout the world, instead of cutting some deal with MBS where he you know do, does some human rights sacrifices in exchange for uh, uh, drilling more oil, it seems like Biden's just kind of giving into this and is going to go suck up to. It. I hope that I'm wrong. We'll see what happens in July, but it seems like Biden feels so desperate on the gas prices for good reason. It seems like the only option is to just butter up this murderer. I hope that we don't do that, and and I, and I think that I, I think that we we should keep following this because this is going to be a story that continues throughout the year. MBS is not just going to you know become a nice authoritarian overnight, and he's not out here to help the United States. Uh, you know, whatever deal he cuts is 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 not going to be the magic elixir that that takes gas prices back to where they were in 2020. Well, I would like to disagree with you, but I can't. I'm certainly willing to make concessions for real politique. I understand that you you sometimes, you know, have to make alliances with unsavory individuals. We've done this before in history. It would be naive to think that you don't necessarily, you know, have to make those kinds of deals. On the other hand, this one just it doesn't at, feel at, like at, real at, politic. Can I just say no, I don't know? It, it feels, I, I'm it feels so, like desperation and weakness. Yeah, it, it, it I'm so too. anti-Saudi yeah. and anti MBS yeah, that like no, I, I probably would still criticize them on the Bullard podcast, even if it was real politic. But but real politic seems better than what we're getting. I guess is what I I'm I see. I agree. That was what I was going to say. That I, I mean, I understand that concept, <laughs> but this doesn't feel like that. It it feels. It, it feels like a surrender, um, both domestically and internationally and uh, and morally. And well, just make, you know, that sentence could go on pretty much forever. Tim Miller, thank you so much for joining me. And once again, uh, thank you for uh, filling in on Monday. If people have not uh, heard that podcast from Monday, go back because it is still online. And we will talk again next week, Tim. And by the way, looking forward to your book. Thanks, Charlie. See everybody. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again. There are about a million podcasts about money, but Bad With Money with Gabby Dunn is the one where finances meet social justice. Investing in dating with Bella Gandhi. Do you believe that people should pay for dating apps? To me, invest in the dating process. There's nothing more important than finding the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. There's a stigma. Everything should be free. You're going to go to Whole Foods, meet eyes over mangoes, and all the dominoes fall in perfect order. That's just a load of garbage. Bad With Money. Listen, wherever you get your podcasts.